Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Green Mountain Care Board, and we're going to get started. Um, the first item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, January 27th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, January 27th, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion carried unanimously. Next, I'm going to turn it over to Susan Barrett for the executive director's report. Susan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a few announcements. First, to let folks know that on February 1st, uh, the board submitted a report. It's uh, Act 159, Section 1. It's um, entitled Price Transparency Dashboard. And essentially, it is an update on the work that the our data team is doing in val first validating um, the data that we have in an effort to move toward a price transparency dashboard for consumers. And that report is located on our website under what's new. It's also located under report legislative reports, but the easiest way to get to it is under what's new. If you have any questions, just reach out and I can um, answer those for you. The other thing I wanted to let folks know is that our web, our um, press release is up for our schedule for February, and that is also located on our homepage under our meetings. Um, yesterday, we had a data governance council meeting that went very well. We heard from our lawyer, uh, our, our um, general counsel, Mike Barber, uh, regarding um, the uh, updates on the the V cures and VUDs rule, so that will be coming over to the board in uh, the near future. Um, we also um, next Monday will have the general advisory committee meeting. Is that Monday the eighth? Is that the correct? date i'm wondering or is that tuesday i just want to make sure that i'm getting this right i'm looking at my calendar right now yep it is monday the 8th um and that is at two to four um we also um have an addition to this uh press release and it's being updated as we speak on wednesday february 17th we'll be having a primary care advisory group meeting and that will start at 5 p.m. and the information as I said will be updated on the press release uh, for all those are in who are interested in joining and that is all I have to update you on thank you thank you Susan um, Mike Barber are you going to tee up uh, the discussion on the QHP or should I turn it right over to Dana I wasn't planning to but I, I could um okay. okay feel free feel free <laughs> okay so the the tee up is that the green mountain care board is required to review and approve with recommendations from diva the benefit package or packages for qualified health benefit plans and reflective silver plans that are offered in vermont uh so on exchange for the for the QHPs and um, off exchange for the reflective silver. Um, there are two categories of plans that are offered, uh, standard plans and non-standard plans. And today we're going to hear from Diva regarding um, proposed changes to the uh, design of the standard plans, uh, which are the plans that are um, the same across carriers. Uh, Pursuant to a 2012 policy, you guys do not need to approve changes uh, if they are are minor. And I imagine that Dana and um, Addie will go over uh, what those kinds of changes are. And that's it. Thank you, Mike. So Dana, if you could introduce uh, yourself and your colleagues. I will. Thank you, everybody, for having us here virtually. And uh, as Michael said, we will be presenting our 
proposed plan designs for the standard qualified health plans for 2022. So today I'm joined by Addie Stremelo, who's our Deputy Commissioner at DIVA, and our partners at Wakely Consulting, Julie Pepper, Brittany Phillips, and um, Brooke Steiner. So I'd like to first turn it over to Addie, who has some initial comments, and, and um, get us started that way. Super. Thank Great. You. Thanks, Dana. Um, and thank you, everyone. It's it's wonderful to see you all virtually. Um, I thought I might just kick things off by uh, providing a little context around uh, kind of what's going on with QHP enrollment, given the extraordinary year that we're coming off of. And... Um, you know, the fact that we're in a somewhat different world than we were last time we were here on this topic. Um, so I, I wanted to convey that on the on the QHP and exchange side of healthcare enrollment, it's actually been quite a stable year. Um, you may know that in last March, we opened up a special enrollment period during the middle of the year to uh, encourage enrollment for uninsured Vermonters who weren't eligible for Medicaid. And we had um, 800 families uh, maintain uh, gain coverage through that special enrollment period. Um, that ran until August. Uh, and then we had our usual open enrollment from November uh, 1st to December 15th. That also was quite stable. Um, there was very little uh, plan selection, so transferring between plans this time around, um, which is interesting. Um, the overall enrollment numbers I can provide to you uh, today, we are still working on getting the plan by plan breakdown across the market. So from the issuers um, to include the small group and the and the off exchange um, QHP enrollment. Um, but our overall QHP enrollment on exchange is down. And this is because our Medicaid enrollment is up essentially um, during the federally declared uh, public health emergency. We're not able to terminate anyone from Medicaid. So that means that our caseload is growing steadily. And this includes people who, under normal circumstances, would likely be um, up in the income levels for QHP and APTC. So uh, last year at this time, we had around 27,000 QHP enrollees on the exchange. We now have uh, a little bit under 25,000, um, which is about 18,000 households. 80% uh, are still eligible for financial assistance. Um, so that ratio has remained uh, constant. Um, and like I said, we're still collecting the data from the issuers to give you that fuller picture, which we expect to have for our next uh, appearance uh, next week. Um, I also wanted to mention that you may have heard that the federal government is uh, doing a kind of a modified open enrollment beginning February 15th, um, again, to encourage enrollment into qualified health plans. We are looking at reopening our COVID-19 special enrollment period and discussing parameters right now. So we'll have more information to share about that. Um, in the next week or so as well. Um, so with respect to plan design, which is our topic for today, uh, I think stability is, is also the theme. Um, the draft AV calculator that dictates a lot of, a lot of this work uh, was published without any changes from last year. So you'll see um, Julie and her team talk through that. Um, the plan designs do reflect one legislative initiative, um, which was around cost sharing for insulin. Um, that did not have a significant AV impact, um, but that you'll see that in the presentation today. Um, so I think it'll be somewhat familiar, but just wanted to provide a little bit of context for you all um, since it's been a while. Um, and with that, I think I'll turn it back to Dana. Thank you. Okay, so why don't I, I'll get started with our presentation slides and ask you to let me know when you can see what I have. We can see them. Well, we can see your email. <laughs> That's not what I wanted there. <laughs> Bear with me, please. There we go. Okay. I'll get us started. Here's just an overview of, of uh, how we will progress. I'm going to provide a brief overview 
and context for our process. And then I will turn it over to our partners at Wakely to present the actual plan design proposals for uh, the QHPs. We will return, we will you know, respond to questions, comments today and return next week for any additional, um, including public comment and then um, aim for our vote next week if possible. Again, for review today, Here's a snapshot of the full array of plans offered on, on and off the exchange. Today, we'll be focusing on the 14 standard plans. That's seven per issuer. One platinum, one gold, two in the silver range, and three bronze plans, and that's per issuer. I want to uh, note, too, that we provided a one-pager of the um, showing the 2021 plans available. Um, these plans will carry over into 2022, but just for your reference to see what's, um, what is currently available on the exchange. And um, there's a brief set of benefits described on that one pager as well. So, in November of each year, I convene our stakeholder group. This has um, uh, really not changed over the years. We have representation from, from DIVA, from each of our issuers, uh, a couple of representatives from the Health Advocates Office of Vermont, and uh, representatives from the staff at both DFR and Vermont Care Board. So we meet from November and finish our work in late January. Our last meeting was just last week, in fact, and it's very active discussion. Um, don't necessarily have consensus on each, um, but we discuss thoroughly and, and put forth, uh, you know, with the best information that we have, the, um, uh, for each plan, we will provide you with a, a preferred option and a uh, backup option as we have in the past. Again, these are not new, but just to uh, bring them before you again, these are the values that uh, guide our decision making. And um, so these are just were things that we're mindful of as we make our decisions. And here are the, the three uh, kind of process highlights that we that refer to um, and that drive our, our um, actual decision process each year. It's in particular this this year, it's important because as uh, Wakely will provide more information on this, um, the 2022 draft AV calculator um, did not apply any um, trend so that um, all of the 2021 plans would have the same AV uh, in 2022, meaning that no, no changes are required. Um, our stakeholder group feels strongly that um, even despite that, we are mindful of the uh, anticipated premium impact that will still take place even without a, um, any impact to the AV calculator for benefit purposes. Um, we're mindful of premium impact, so we are proposing changes to to each of the plans, as you'll see. I won't um, read this out loud, but I just want to point out that silver loading, as has been described, will continue into 2022 with the um, quote unquote loaded silver premium on exchange and the lower reflective silver plans available off exchange through the issuers directly. Here's a, a high level look at our outline of um, certification timeline. As you know, aiming to get approval on our plan designs in February, all issuers um, submit their forms to DFR for review and approval in March. That process is scheduled to wrap up in June. We expect to receive the final payment notice and the IRS limits in spring 2021. 
And as always, we will um, inform the board of any um, plan design impacts that, that come from that, um, you know, in that time frame in the spring. Uh, rates submissions are in May, as you know, and that process continues ending in decisions planned in, <clears throat> in early August. And then following that, it's the DIVA plan certification, that formal approval process at the end of August in advance of open enrollment, November 1 to December 15. So every, all these interconnected steps. So if there are no questions or um, comments at this point, I'd like to turn it over. I believe it would be uh, Brittany, you'll be leading us through the presentation. Yeah, thanks, Dina. Would you like to uh, share your screen? Yeah, I can do that. Let me go ahead and pull mine up. All right. Can everybody see my screen in the presentation? Yes, we can. Great, thanks. Um, so I'm Brittany Phillips. I'm a senior consulting actuary with Wakely. Um, we've worked closely with Dana and the stakeholder group to develop the recommended plan designs for 2022 for the standard plans that, that Dana walked through. Um, so I'm going to start by talking through some of the proposed regulation changes and AVC changes um, that are happening between 2021 and 2022. Um, as is been mentioned a couple times, um, stability was really kind of the theme and, and there are really very few um, changes, but we will walk through those briefly. Um, and then we'll spend the bulk of the presentation actually taking a look at the recommended plan design changes for each of those uh, seven different plans that Dana had mentioned um, and, and going through kind of the decision process in, in terms of how we landed on these recommendations. Okay, um, so the first piece that I want to discuss are the um, changes in the notice of benefit and payment parameters. Um, so this uh, is the regulatory update that is provided each year. Um, currently, it's still in draft format for 2022, or, or the bulk of it, I should say, is in draft format um, for 2022. Um, so all of the changes that we're showing here are still subject to change in the final version. Um, generally, the changes tend to be pretty small, but just a, a comment that, that these could be updated. Um, so the annual limitation on cost sharing, this is the maximum out of pocket for all plans is proposed to be 9,100 in 2022. Um, this is an increase from 8,550 in 2021. Um, generally, this increase has been, you know, $200 or so. Last year, the increase was a little bit larger, I think in the four or $500 range. And um, as you can see this year, it's again, a, a substantial increase compared to what we had seen. Um, the federal HDHP minimum deductible and out-of-pocket maximum limits are not released um, for 2022 for the high deductible health plans. Um, so these are released separately from the notice of benefit and payment parameters and actually have different limitations than, um, than standard plans than non-high deductible plans. Um, so we just want to note that for 2021, the minimum single deductible is $1,400 and the out-of-pocket maximum is $7,000. Um, the minimum deductible typically increases $50 every two to three years. Um, the last increase was for the 2020 plan year. Um, so this may or may not increase for 2022. It's, it's difficult to say at this time. Generally, these are released um, around April each year. So we do have a couple months um, likely until that's that's finalized. Um, and then the MOOP increases about $100 each year. So we anticipate that the 7,000 will increase to 7,100. But again, that's not final um, or known for sure at this time. So we ha do have a couple um, caveats as we're looking at the recommended plan designs around uh, these numbers still being draft. Um, uh, currently. 
Um, there were other changes in the notice of benefit and payment parameters um, that was released. They don't specifically impact plan designs um, directly, so we haven't necessarily included them here um, since our focus is on those standard plan designs, but uh, did just want to mention that. Um, okay, so the actuarial value calculator, um, this slide is just kind of a high level overview in case there's anybody that's that's new to these meetings. Um, but this model is released by um, Sosayo each year and it's updated, generally updated each year. Um, and this is the model that we are required to use to determine the actuarial value of a plan for purposes of determining um, compliance with the meta level requirements. So we are required to use this model to determine whether the plans fall within the um, required de minimis AV range. Um, the calculator includes a lot of different inputs for, for various plan design features, deductibles, out-of-pocket maximums, um, member cost sharing, so co-pays and, and or co-insurance amounts for several different service categories. Um, and then whether the deductible applies for those categories. Um, as you can see here, it, it doesn't, it, it's not an exhaustive model. It doesn't include inputs for every single uh, service category, but it does um, include some of the more, more common ones, emergency room, inpatient, primary care, and so on, um, as well as pharmacy inputs. Um, just to note that some plan design features are not supported um, and not uh, able to be input into the actuarial value calculator. Um, so for these features, if they're considered substantial, an actuary can either modify the input to try and closely uh, represent the plan design, or they can actually modify the results of the calculator uh, to account for these features. So this does require an actuarial certification. Um, there are some plan designs, some of the standard plan designs um, that do require these adjustments. Um, and so the uh, actuarial values that you'll see on the following slides for some of these plan designs are the adjusted actuarial values and, and reflect the, the adjustments we've made to account for these features that are not accommodated. Um, another comment, just a, a note, is that the AV from the calculator is different than the pricing AV that carriers will use to determine premium amounts. Um, a couple of the, the major differences is that the federal ABC is based on summarized national data, um, whereas the carriers obviously would use their own experience. Um, and each carrier is likely to use their own model. Um, and that methodology, that underlying methodology may differ from the, the ABC. Um, and then as, as already mentioned, not all service categories are represented in the ABC. Um, and so the carriers may have more uh, granularity or specification for some of those service categories in their own models. Um, so looking at the changes from the 2021 draft calculator, it's already been mentioned that uh, there were actually no changes um, from the 2021 final calculator to the draft 2022 calculator. Um, the methodology documentation cited, you know, the uncertainty around COVID-19 and trying to ensure um, kind of stability in terms of plan designs and with so much uncertainty around COVID and trying not to, you know, add additional um, changes to plan designs. Um, so the 2022 draft federal ABC, you know, the underlying claims were not changed. There was no trend applied from 2021 to try to estimate claim costs in 2022 um, and really limited impact. So I believe Dana already mentioned um, all of the plan designs we're showing here because there were no changes to the underlying calculator. There are no required changes to the plan designs in order to meet those de minimis AV requirements and maintain those meta level certifications. Um, again, the similar to the notice of benefit and payment parameters, I should note that the calculator is also still in draft format. Um, so any potential changes between the draft version and the final version for 2022 could um, require additional updates to these plan designs. Um, yeah, and this is just to chime in for a minute that yeah. just to 
um, clarify that I think in the past, you know, we've we've done this before when things have been in draft, and it's been more unlikely that there'd be changes. Um, with the draft being from the prior administration, you know, and then the new administration has put a freeze on any kind of draft regulation so they can kind of get up to speed. We're still not anticipating any significant changes here, um, but there is probably a, a slightly increased chance for changes um, to either the AV calculator or the notice benefit payment parameters given the new administration. But uh, we're cautiously optimistic given that the, the timing of, of these needed to be final probably won't give them a lot of time to uh, make any significant changes, but just wanted to flag that there's a little bit of additional uncertainty this year around that. Yeah, thanks, Julie. Mm -hmm. Uh, one note before we start looking at the recommended plan designs, um, we are showing an estimated premium impact in the following slides. Um, one of the key considerations in determining the recommended plan designs is trying to balance the premium impact of uh, plan design changes along with, you know, the consumer cost sharing um, and trying not to have, you know, major changes to the, the member experience in that sense. So, these premium changes that we're showing are based on Wakely's internal model. Um, the actual premium change is going to be different than, than these values. What we're showing is really meant to isolate the impact of leveraging um, and the impact of the plant uh, benefit design changes. We don't include um, impacts for just underlying medical cost trend, um, any network changes, um, or you know, really anything else that that will go into the final premium determination by the carriers. And again, similar to the AVC, you know, Wakely's using our own internal model, but there will be differences in the models that the carriers are using as well. So um, these are just meant to really show kind of the trade-off between benefit changes and premium impact, um, but shouldn't be taken necessarily as like this is what the premium impact is going to be for 2022. Um, so as we've mentioned a couple times, because there were no changes between the final 2021 calculator and the 2022 draft calculator, um, as you can see in that table below, all of the plans um, did not have a change in AV. They all continue to be within the acceptable range um, for each of their respective metal tiers. Um, but as you'll see in subsequent slides, we are still showing some recommended changes um, this year, and we can kind of get into those. It's, it's more to, again, balance the premium increases as well as the benefit changes. Um, we did want to note that the AV ranges for uh, the HDHPs have been adjusted. So rather than um, having a minus four and plus 2%, uh, AV range around the, the standard range, uh, we have a 0.5% cushion um, on the high end in order to uh, reflect the waiving of the deductible for preventive prescription drugs. Um, we've had that cushion for several years, um, and we did discuss this with the carriers this year to ensure that that 0.5% um, amount is continues to be appropriate. Um, so we did take a look at that. Uh, one other item that we wanted to mention is the um, Bill S-296 limiting out-of-pocket expenses for insulin. Addie briefly mentioned this. Um, this limits the member's total out-of-pocket responsibility to $100 per 30-day supply for insulin prescriptions. Um, this would be new for 2022. Um, this Breaking out of just the insulin prescriptions is not accommodated by the federal calculator um, and so is a potential feature that could require an adjustment from the AV calculator output to um, the final AV. We did review national data and utilization information from the Vermont carriers to see if this um, this out-of-pocket limit is meaningful and um, in order to develop the adjustments to the ABC output. What we found is that the input or the impact is relatively small um, between a zero and 0.1 percent impact 
um, on the AV, depending on the metal level. So the, the platinum plans tend to be at the lower end. The bronze plans tend to be at the higher end of that range. Um, however, this impact does not push any of the current or recommended plan designs outside of that de minimis range. Um, so the AVs here are not adjusted for this impact. But again, these this impact is, is relatively small and, and doesn't actually push any of them outside of the range. So um, just wanted to note that we did uh, take a look at that and consider it in these plan designs. Um, in past years, for those of you that have been on these calls before, what we've kind of done is taken a look at the metal level uh, plan designs, the recommended and alternative, and then have kind of a discussion around the um, what the stakeholders considered in, in coming up with those recommended designs. Um, for most of the metal levels, those conversations were very similar. So um, just as kind of a, an overview of how we determine the changes and, and landed on these recommended plan designs. Um, the Even though the 2021 plan designs are all within the range and don't actually require changes from 2021, um, you'll see we are recommending some minor changes across all of the metal levels um, to increase cost sharing, which will limit the impact on premium. Um, it also allows if we make, you know, some incremental changes this year, the idea is that hopefully in future years, the changes are a little bit smaller as well. So continuing to make some updates, um, consumers are, are used to, you know, some small changes year over year. So this is in line with what they would expect as well. Um, and overall, the stakeholders are, you know, choosing to limit the impact on you know, different services. So rather than, you know, spreading a lot of small changes across a lot of service categories, you'll notice we're hitting just a couple um, benefit features and benefit designs in our updates. Um, so this slide is just a reminder of the changes that require um, approval from the Green Mountain Care Board, as was mentioned. Um, small minor changes do not require formal approval. Um, so you can see uh, any copay changes less than or equal to $15, coinsurance less than or equal to five percentage points, um, deductible changes that are less than or equal to $200, um, and out-of-pocket changes that are less than the federal um, out-of-pocket maximum increase um, as well don't require changes. So we know on all of the following slides, we are showing all of the recommended changes um, even those that do not require formal approval, um, and we've separated those out uh, on the following slides. So any changes um, are shown in orange, and then any changes that also require uh, approval from the board are shaded in green to try and kind of separate just changes that don't require approval from those that do. Um, so this slide is just an overview of the changes in the recommended plan designs from 2021 to 2022. Um, we'll be going through all of these changes in more detail as we look at the plans individually. Um, the one thing I do want to point out on this slide is that the only plan that actually has changes requiring um, approval is the bronze plan without the pharmacy limit, um, the bronze deductible plan without the pharmacy limit. So on this plan we are um, looking at an increase to the medical deductible from $8,400 to $8,700, um, which is outside that range, so it does require approval. However, all of the other plan designs, the changes that we are recommending are below kind of those, those thresholds to require approval. Um, we're also requesting approval of a change to the pediatric vision benefits. Um, so we'll take a little bit closer look at that on the next slide, but I did want to point out that that's included in um, the discussion. Um, so for the pediatric vision exam and materials, these are an EHB. Um, I think currently the cost sharing on these um, services varies based on the metal level. Um, so platinum tends to have lower cost sharing, bronze has, has the higher cost sharing. So you can see it ranges from $20 to $85 for these services. Um, so as part of the stakeholder group discussions this year, uh, the group agreed to establish uniform 
a cost sharing structure that doesn't vary based on meta level and, and doesn't vary across the plans. Um, so in this case, uh, the benefit would allow for $20 for a $20 optometrist copay and $20 copay on glasses or contacts um, per year or for one visit per, or pair for the year. Um, and then for the high deductible plans, this benefit would kick in once the deductible has been met per the requirements to be considered an HDHP. Um, so it really improves access to vision care and supplies for children, um, kind of maintaining this uniform benefit across the plans, um, regardless of the, the meta level. Um, and the insurers have priced this to impact premiums between $10 and $20 per year um, at the most. But we we have included that as one of the, the recommended changes, though it's not explicitly included in the actuarial value calculator. Um, so it's not necessarily reflected on the following uh, slides with the plan designs by themselves. Okay. So finally getting into the plan designs, um, we'll start with the platinum deductible plan um, and kind of the structure as we go through the presentation will be the same for all of the plan designs. So the first slide we have is just kind of a history of the plan design and how this plan design has changed over time. Um, and then on the next slide, we'll show the recommended and alternative plans that the stakeholders um, agreed upon. So for the platinum deductible plan, um, you can see that from 2014 to 2016, the plan design actually did not change. Um, since then, the deductible has increased um, most years, though not in the last couple. Um, the out-of-pocket maximum has increased about every other year. Um, and there have been, back in 2020, there were some um, sweeping changes to the office visit co-pays. Um, these changes were really to uh, made to the PCP copay and specialist copays and other copays as well to maintain similar um, distinctions between those copays. So again, you know, having a higher uh, urgent care copay to encourage office visit use, that sort of thing. So um, maintaining those relationships across the the different categories. Um, so for 2022, uh, the leftmost column is the 2021 plan design um, so that you can see the changes uh, side by side. In the 2022 recommended design for this plan, we're really only recommending a $50 increase to the medical deductible. So from $350 to $400, um, you can see in this case, the estimated premium impact, we are still showing a slight increase to the estimated premium with this, this change. Um, the 2022 alternative design is actually maintaining the same 2021 plan design. Um, and you can see there, the premium impact is slightly higher. Um, because the federal AVC did not change this year, you can see that um, in the alternative design, there's no impact to the federal AV, but in the 2022 recommended design, there is a small decrease of 0.3%. Um, but again, the, the theme is really trying to make some incremental changes in order to um, reduce that premium impact a little bit. Consumers are used to seeing some small incremental changes. And so hopefully, you know, making changes this year, even though they're not required, um, can result in uh, smaller changes in future years. Looking at the history of the gold deductible plan, um, the changes here uh, have been a little bit more sweeping, I think, than, than the platinum design. Similar to the platinum design, these uh, this plan was not changed from 2014 to 2016. Um, since then, the medical deductible and out-of-pocket maximums have increased most years. Um, the pharmacy out-of-pocket maximum has increased about every other year. This tends to be somewhat in line with the changes to the HDHP um, minimum deductible requirement. Um, the changes that were made last year, in addition to the deductible and out-of-pocket maximum, were an increase to the pharmacy generic and preferred brand copays. Um, so some small changes there. Um, back in 2020, 
the uh, PCP specialist um, office visit copays were were increased as well. So here, looking at the changes recommended for 2022, um, we are recommending an increase to the medical and pharmacy deductibles. Um, the medical deductible is a $100 increase from 1100 to 1200 um, and a $50 increase to the pharmacy deductible, as well as a $200 increase to the out-of-pocket maximum. Um, the alternative design, similar to the Platinum Plan, is just maintaining the current 2021 plan design. Um, as you can see, Doing that, the estimated premium impact is 0.8%, a little less than 1%, just maintaining the current plan design. Um, however, the recommended plan design, making those changes to the dedu deductible and out-of-pocket maximum brings that premium impact down to 0.3% approximately. Taking a look at the silver deductible plan, um, this plan has changed each year. So unlike the gold and platinum plans, there were changes made between 2014 and 2016. Um, again, kind of similar story, the deductible, um, medical deductible and pharmacy deductible have increased most years, though they did not increase from 2020 to 2021. Um, the integrated deductible and out-of-pocket maximum have increased. Um, again, the out-of-pocket maximum increased most years. Um, last year, there were no other changes besides the medical out-of-pocket maximum and pharmacy out-of-pocket maximum. Um, however, in 2020, there were um, several changes across different service categories, including um, the coinsurance that applies to inpatient and outpatient and facility services, as well as increases to the PCP um, and specialist office visit co-pays. Um, so because there were so many changes made in 2020, uh, the desire in 2021 was to keep the changes somewhat minimal. So again, very similar to the um, platinum and gold recommended plan designs, um, the recommendation for the silver deductible plan is to increase the medical deductible um, $200, the pharmacy deductible by $50, and the out-of-pocket maximum by $400. Um, so this puts the um, out-of-pocket maximum of $85.50 is equal to the 2021 limit, um, federal limit. Um, and that's kind of been the uh, the trend on this plan design over the last several years is to um, increase that out of pocket maximum to the level from the prior year. So not taking it all the way up to the to the maximum, but um, sort of maintaining that that same a similar increase as the federal limit. Um, again, the 2022 alternative design is to keep the plan design um, the same as 2021, uh, that results in a premium impact of about a one and a half percent if there are no changes made. Again, this is just the um, meant to represent the benefit um, design impact um, and doesn't account for, you know, other potential changes that will uh, lead to premium changes. Um, so by making some of these changes to the medical deductible, um, pharmacy deductible and out-of-pocket maximum, that brings that premium impact down to 0.6%. Um, so again, the, the theme here is really, you know, making some incremental changes to the benefit designs um, in order to balance, you know, those benefit cost-sharing changes with the premium impact changes. Um, looking at the silver HDHP option, um, again, kind of a similar story. The medical deductible has increased most years as well as the out-of-pocket maximum. Um, the pharmacy deductible and out-of-pocket maximum is tied to the minimum deductible on HDHPs. Um, that's that federal limit that is released in uh, April each year. So that um, corresponds with those, those updates. Um, the family uh, deductible and out-of-pocket maximum on these plans, there is an embedded single out-of-pocket maximum. 
um, that is a little bit different than the um, medical out-of-pocket maximum. So that amount um, began in 2016 and has tied to the annual federal limit each year. Um, so for 2021, it was increased to 8550 um, you'll see our recommendation is to, again, tie that to the federal limit um, and increase it to the draft proposed of 9,100. Um, the coinsurance rate on this plan has also been increased a couple times. Um, it hasn't been increased since 2018, but it um, has increased from um, where this plan started at 20%. Um, so looking at the recommended plan options. Um, as I mentioned on both the recommended and alternative designs, we are showing an increase to that embedded um, single out-of-pocket maximum to the uh, federal limit of 9,100. Again, that, that number is draft. Um, we're not expecting changes, but it, it could need to be updated based on the final regulations, as, as Julie mentioned. Um, in the recommended design, we're also recommending an increase of $100 to the medical deductible. Um, again, this is to try and kind of balance some of the uh, premium impact changes um, versus the cost sharing changes. So in this case, the 2022 alternative design um, really maintains the same 2021 plan design with the exception of that embedded um, single out-of-pocket maximum and results in a premium impact of about 1.3%, again, based on Wakeley's models, um, whereas the recommended design is really a small increase to the deductible um, and brings down that premium impact to 0.9%. So in this plan, we are, are showing a little bit higher premium impact than we had on the um, previous plan designs that we have looked at at the platinum and gold levels. Um, but still trying to balance those those changes. Um, I've kind of mentioned this, but I do want to point it out. We've got that box here on the right of the uh, slide um, mentioning the HGHP minimum deductible. Um, so for 2022, that number is not yet known. Um, it will likely be released in around April, um, sometime this spring. Um, so for 2021, that number is $1,400. Um, the pharmacy deductible and out-of-pocket maximum on these plans are aligned with that amount um, based on the regulations in Vermont. Um, therefore, if this number were to increase from 1400 those um, plan designs would also need to update to match the minimum deductible. Um, so as I mentioned, that amount increases $50 every two to three years. Generally, that's that's been the, the trend on that. Um, the last increase was 2020, so it's possible that it could go up to 1450 this year, potentially next year. Um, so we did take a look at the impact of increasing the pharmacy deductible and out-of-pocket maximum on these plans to 1450 in case it were to increase. Um, and the, the impact is, you know, less than 0.1%. It's very small um, as far as the impact on AV and the, the premium impact we're showing here. So moving on, there are uh, three bronze plans. So the first plan is the deductible plan with the pharmacy limit. Um, this one is, again, very similar to what we've been seeing on the other plan designs. The deductible has increased each year um, and the out-of-pocket maximum has increased each year as well. Um, this plan design has seen, the bronze plans in general um, have seen a much larger changes year over year relative to the other plan designs. Um, the impact of the changes on the AVC have um, significantly increased the bronze plan designs historically, um, or increased the AV on the bronze plan designs historically. So much larger changes are needed to bring those designs back into compliance with the uh, de minimis range. Um, in 2021, I do wanna point out that last year, there were actually a couple benefit enhancements to these plan designs. Um, so previously, the drug deductible applied for all scripts. Um, last year, the decision was made to waive it for generic scripts. Um, and similarly, the generic copay uh, was reduced from $20 to $15. Um, so the 
the bronze de minimis range uh, has a upper bound of plus 2%. Um, it actually has an upper bound of plus 5%. So it could go from uh, 60 up to 65% if there are certain plan design criteria met. And one of those is waiving the deductible for um, significant um, benefit categories, including generic scripts. So um, by waiving the deductible for generic scripts, we actually are able to have kind of a higher AV on this plan. Um, and so in order to meet those requirements, um, the decision was made to waive the deductible on generic scripts um, for the plan design last year in order to get kind of that increased range on the, the applicable AV. So looking at the recommendations for 2022, um, again, we're um, really looking at just increasing the medical and pharmacy deductibles as well as the out-of-pocket maximum. Um, in this case, the 2022 recommended design is a $200 increase to the medical deductible, $100 increase to the pharmacy deductible, and a $300 increase to the out-of-pocket maximum. Um, this results in a approximately a 1% premium impact. Um, the alternative design actually further increases the medical deductible and out-of-pocket maximum, but um, has a smaller premium impact at about 0.6%. Um, so this trend, I guess, is a little bit different than what we've been seeing on the other plan designs where the recommendation was really to leave the plan design or the alternative was really to leave the plan design alone. Um, the premium impact that we're estimating for these plan designs of leaving it alone was significantly higher um, than on the other meta levels. Um, and so in that case, you know, balancing that premium impact and the benefit changes um, was a lot uh, more difficult, I think, in terms of, of trying to decide where that, that balance is. Um, so in this case, uh, we are showing a little bit higher premium impact on this plan under the recommended design than what we were seeing on the other metal levels. Um, but it was really about making sure that the changes to those deductible and out-of-pocket maximums um, was limited and, and you know, kind of do it, ending in that trade-off between those benefit impacts and the, the um, premium impact. On these plans, because the deductible and out-of-pocket maximums are so high, it requires much larger changes in order to make um, kind of an impact and make a significant impact on that, that premium amount. Um, one thing I do want to note here, so the 2021 um, out-of-pocket maximum is uh, set at 85.50. That's the, the federal limit. Um, so the draft proposed limit is 9,100. Both of these plan designs are within that range. However, as Julie mentioned, that there is potential that there could be some changes between the draft and final regulation. So, you know, if that comes in anywhere lower than 8,700, the um, these plan designs would need to be um, updated to be in compliance with that that limit. So, not expected, but did want to to mention it as, as a potential possibility that, that those amounts could come in slightly lower and, and would need to be updated. Um, the other thing I wanna mention on these plans is the recommended plan design. Um, all of the changes are below those thresholds requiring formal approval. However, under the alternative design, that medical deductible increase of $250 um, would require formal approval. So this is the first plan that we've really seen changes that are um, above that threshold for formal approval. Um, the next plan design that we'll take a look at is the bronze deductible plan. This one does not have the pharmacy limit applied. Um, this was a new plan that was introduced back in 2018, so there isn't as much history with this plan. Um, and the idea was that it really um, was to give more uh, access to office visits before the deductible and, you know, have an option for members who um, maybe don't expect to use as many pharmacy benefits or, you know, those sorts of things. So to give kind of another option for members 
um, under this bronze plan because the uh, changes were were so high um, on the other plan. So the medical deductible and out-of-pocket maximum has increased each year. Um, you can see that these are um, set equal to each other. So the idea on this plan is that um, you know a member could access office visits um, for a copay um, as well as generic scripts um, prior to the deductible prior to having to meet the deductible um, and then for any sort of facility service and facility services or, or imaging that sort of thing um, the deductible would need to be met but once that deductible is met those uh, services are covered in full Um, so in line with the recommendations on the other plans, as well as the changes that we've seen on this plan over the last several years, um, the 2022 recommended plan design is increasing the medical deductible and out-of-pocket maximum from 8,400 to 8,700. Um, the alternative design, kind of similar to the last bronze plan, does still increase um, the deductible and out-of-pocket maximum even though changes are not necessarily required and again this is um, to really try and balance the premium impact so you can see on this plan design even with the $300 increase to the deductible and out-of-pocket maximum that premium impact is approximately 1.1 percent which is the highest premium impact we've seen on any of the plan designs we've looked at so far um, and under the alternative design it's a smaller deductible and out-of-pocket maximum, but again, a larger premium impact. Um, and similar to the, the last plan, that um, annual limitation on cost sharing is draft at 9,100. So these do meet the um, that requirement, but if it were to come in below the 8,700 that we're showing here, um, adjustments would need to be made to this plan design. This plan design, the recommended design, um, does require a uh, formal approval um, that medical deductible increase of $300 is above that threshold. So um, that has been shaded in green here on this, this slide. Uh, the last plan design that we have to look at is the bronze HDHP. Um, Similar to the silver HDHP, this has that um, embedded single out-of-pocket maximum that is tied to the annual limitation on cost sharing each year. So you can see that has increased um, every year since 2016 in kind of this middle section here. Um, in addition, the medical deductible and out-of-pocket maximums have increased most years. Um, and the pharmacy deductible and out-of-pocket maximum, again, is tied to that uh, minimum deductible for HDHPs, which is that federal limit um, that has not yet been released for 2022. Um, the changes from 2021 were were fairly small. The um, deductibles and uh, were maintained from 2020. Um, the only increase was really to that medical out-of-pocket maximum on this plan. So looking at the 2022 recommended um, designs, the recommendation and the alternative are, are very similar. Um, so under the recommended design, we're looking at a $200 increase to the medical deductible as well as the out-of-pocket maximum. Again, we've increased that embedded a single out-of-pocket maximum to the draft proposed limit of 9,100, um, consistent with where that has been, been set in prior years. Um, and under this recommended design, we are showing the largest premium impact of any of the plans that we've looked at at 1.3%. Um, so again, kind of the trend across the board with the bronze plan designs is that uh, it really requires much larger changes to impact um, kind of that premium impact and, and bring that down. Um, the alternative design is the same as the recommended. The only difference is that that medical out-of-pocket maximum is at 7,000. Um, again, you know, it, the deductible changes on this plan really um, have a minimal impact in terms of the premium impact. So um, under the recommendation, that additional $100 increase to the out-of-pocket maximum um, really brings down that estimated premium impact a little bit, but again, it's it's pretty high. So the stakeholders, I think, went back and forth quite a bit on this plan design, trying to determine the, the 
um, most appropriate balance for the for the members in terms of deductible increases and, and benefit increases while also trying to um, keep in mind that that premium impact change. Um, so on this plan design, similar to the silver HDHP, um, the pharmacy deductible and out-of-pocket maximum are tied to that HDHP minimum deductible. So for 2022, if that were to increase from 1400, um, this plan design would need to be updated to align with that new amount. Um, again, the, the AV impact and premium impact of changes there are very small. Um, and then the other item that we wanted to mention is that the HDHP out-of-pocket maximum for 2020 one is seven thousand um, dollars we anticipate that that will come in at seven hundred seventy one hundred for 2022 um, just based on historical increases and, and how that amount is determined however um, because that amount has not been released and is not known um, and finalized yet if it were to come in lower than seventy one hundred um, this recommended plan design, we'd likely need to move to the um, alternative design. Um, again, this plan design does not require formal approval. All of the changes are, are below that threshold. Um, so the only one that really requires approval is that bronze deductible plan without the pharmacy limit. Okay. So that is all of the plan designs. Um, this slide, again, just highlights the changes that, that we went through um, in terms of those recommended plan designs. Um, as I mentioned, the bronze deductible plan without the pharmacy limit is the only one that actually requires formal approval. Um, and then in addition to these plan design changes, we we're also uh, requesting approval of the change to the pediatric vision benefits that I discussed um, towards the beginning of the, the presentation. So at this point, I'm going to open it up for questions um, and discussion on on the plan designs. If, if there's anything that any slides that we need to go back through or, or anything, please let me know. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank Brittany. you. We'll go in uh, reverse alphabetical order and I'm going to start with Maureen. Maureen. OK, thanks. Um, just a couple questions. Uh, I know there's only really one change that we need to approve, but just looking at um, your premium, the estimate of your premium impacts, which I know is just an estimate, um, they're relatively low other than for the bronze plan. And just wondering historically how close have you been? And when I mean relatively low, they're you know half a percent um, increases or less in a lot in most of the cases and mm -hmm. so um that would seem pretty reasonable for for a premium change but just wondering if we look back at last year which i didn't do how would that compare you know how would it compare to what actually happened and what you guys were predicting yeah so i don't think that the there I, it's kind of an apples and oranges comparison um to be perfectly honest so the premium impacts that we're showing on these slides are really meant to show the just the impact of the benefit changes. Um, so the leveraging of the deductible and out-of-pocket maximum and those sorts of things, we're not including like this This 1.3% that we're showing here on the bronze HTHP doesn't account for, you know, just the underlying claim cost trend, um, any network changes or, you know, any of those other things that really go into the premium change. Um, so, it's so it's not really a direct comparison, okay. yeah. And then just a couple questions on the the out of pocket maximums. When we look at the um, HDHP plans compared to the base plans for either bronze or silver, um, it's just interesting that over you know historically, if you look back maybe five years ago the out-of-pocket would be higher for the HTHP. And then every year they've had relatively small changes. And now the base plan is a lot higher um, for silver compared to the HTHP or for bronze. It just seems counterintuitive. And I just wonder, you know, why it's not that we're going to change that. But, it, you know, it just seems if I got a, an HTHP, high, you know, high, high deductible plan, um, you know, that my out-of-pocket would probably be higher than it would be for the base silver or bronze. Yeah, so these are really increase-based, it's formulaic 
the way that those are increased and it's, you know, a regulatory requirement, the way that those are increased. So um, they just, the the bottom line is they're different calculations and they don't align um, necessarily. But yeah, so you can see that I'm, we're estimating that the out-of-pocket maximum for these HDHPs is only going to be a $100 increase from 2021 to that 7,100. Whereas on the base plans we're seeing, I think it was a $550 um, increase. And it really has to do with the the calculations, I think, underlying those um, those requirements. And, and yeah, just, no, it just is, it's like that, something yeah. that people should start to consider when you look at if what your out-of-pockets would be for that. And I guess similarly, the silver seems to be catching up to the bronze on the base plants. <laughs> like over the years, it's getting a lot closer than, than you would see for like, you know, the gold and silver has a pretty good disparity. I think it was what, like 5,400 and the silver is what, 87 or 85.50 and the bronze is 87. So they're, they're getting pretty close, the silver and the bronze. But it's just a comment. Yeah. And that's all I have. Thank you, Maureen. Tom? <laughs> Thank you um, for all these moving parts. <laughs> um, I want to pick up a little bit on um, where Maureen uh, you know, was talking about the relationship of these medical deductibles and, and premiums. And um, I'm, you know, as, as in your answer to her, uh, kind of, you, you you kind of imply that it's very hard to be predictive about the premiums because there's so many moving parts and things you don't know. And by the time it gets to us in rate review, you know, um, there will be a lot of, uh, of uh, you know, activity and input. And so I'm just wondering from a, the point of view of affordability and thinking about uh, the, the members out there, whether or not having the lower deductible um, is a fix, that because that's not going to change between now and, and you know, and we get to the end. Uh, whereas the premiums, it is there's so many moving parts, we, we won't be able to trace whether or not your calculations um, hold true or ha have a lot of merit. So I'm just so that discussion must have um, occurred. Uh, to some extent, about whether or not to kind of be sure that we're doing the best we can for the members in terms of a lower deductible, um, as opposed to relying on somehow uh, that higher deductible filtering through to the to the premium. Yeah. So I what I I will say on at least on the bronze plane designs and what we've heard anecdotally. Um, is that, you know, members buying these bronze plan designs are really shopping on premium. Um, you know, they're, they're purchasing the bronze plans because they have the lowest premium. And so they're very premium sensitive. Um, and so I think that's one consideration on, on the bronze plans. Whereas on the silver plans, you know, a lot of those members are receiving, um, you know, federal subsidies, the, the APTC subsidies, and so they may not feel the premium impact quite as much. And so um, I think the, the considerations between the different metal levels can really kind of vary depending on, on which metal level um, you're, you're looking at. And so it's, it's definitely a, a consideration, I think, that the stakeholders are um, making when we're looking at, you know, all of the different plan designs and um, I should mention that when we were discussing with the stakeholders, you know, here we're showing kind of a recommended and alternative, but on a lot of these plan designs, we looked at several more options um, and kind of landing on, on these couple options that we're showing here. Um, again, trying to, to really balance kind of the, the benefit changes and the, the premium changes. Um, but it is, you know, a difficult discussion, especially on, you know, I think the the bronze plan design where those deductibles and out-of-pocket maximums are so high to begin with. Yeah, and, and this is Julie. I'll, uh, one thing I'll add, I think Brittany covered um, uh, most of it, but 
you know, in years where they've had a, a prior year where the AB calculator wasn't updated, and then the next year it, it took a pretty big jump in terms of how much the AB shifted. And so then the members saw a huge change in their plan designs. So I think we're also trying to um, hedge a little bit in case that happens, that members see more of a modest increase year over year, as opposed to potentially in 2023 seeing um, a, a really large change in their plan designs. Hard, hard to know what's actually going to happen um, with the with the AV calculator um, next year with the new administration. But again, um, based on what we've seen historically. I just want to echo what's been said, the, you bringing up the exact balance that we're trying to, um, to reach between out-of-pocket increases and anticipated premium increases, knowing that at least for the uh, population going through the exchange, if, if they're eligible for APTC, they will have some uh, significant premium protection there. But, um, you know, it, and then as Brittany said too, it's especially challenging in the bronze plans we find. And there's a lot of discussion among the, among the stakeholders about which lever to go for uh, among, among limited choices. Well, I appreciate all that. I just wish there was a, a solid way as a board member, you could follow the bouncing ball to the system. Um, it, it does seem to me that if, if the deductibles are lower, that's a guarantee that members out there will, ex that will be their experience. Whereas with the premium, uh, there's uh, just so many moving parts. Um, but it, I, I get it. Um, I was also uh, spent some time kind of looking at the kind of five-year increase in the medical deductu deductible trends. I know it's not a kind of a flat line, but if you look at the platinum uh, medical deductible from 2017 to 2022, the proposed one, um, that's an annual rate increase of 12.5%. The gold is 7.2%. The silver is 9.6%. The bronze uh, uh, with um, the RX limit is 7%, and the bronze without the RX limit is 5.8 percent, and um, so <clears throat> though you know, you know, for me, those numbers are the growth of those numbers is, is all part of the affordable affordability issue. And your definition of affordability is to balance the impact, of, you know, of premium versus uh, uh, con consumer cost sharing. But I'm uh, I'm I'm just just you know uh, you you know I, I'm just caught by the fact that that uh, these deductible medical deductible rates are growing at that kind of rate um, and premiums are also except for this last year I think it was a you know a, a good job was done so um, I think you've answered my question I uh, I just wish I could get my arms around you know what would be the premium increase if the deductible stayed flat? Something, you know, that kind of gives uh, some uh, real insight into that decision. And I'm not sure that um, it, it's as I said, we could follow the balancing ball. Another another area um, and that I was looking at are um, at was the premium cost shift, and this may be. Uh, is more for um, uh, Dana than for you folks as actuaries, but um, <clears throat> you did do that study for um, under Act 63 in terms of of m mitigating to some extent the premium cliff at 400% of poverty, and uh, there was one option in there that uh, you know for those folks would have lowered um, their a contribution by about 10% and it would have cost the state about $2 million in, 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 in the state share. And I'm just wondering if as part of this process for this year, the conversation came up as to uh, the recommendations into Act 63 and the uh, possibilities of um, mitigating to some degree the premium cliff at 400% of poverty. Well, to be well, honest, that really, that really wasn't a, a lever we believed we could impact this year in our discussion um, in terms of the premium impacts versus the um, FPLs. Um, you know, again, there are very limited levers that we have available to us. So, 
This is Julie. I mean, yeah, I'm not sure if if the plan design stakeholder group has the authority to uh, change premium subsidies. But um, one thing to keep in mind is uh, there is some expectation that the the new administration is considering getting rid of that cliff. Um, they're actually considering making several changes um, to the uh, federal premium subsidies, getting rid of the cliff, lowering the income threshold, fixing the family glitch. I think you know what actually comes through is is still to be determined. Um, but it's, it's possible there might be some relief, whether that's for 2022 or, or, or further into the future. We're not sure yet. Yeah, I, 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 I've seen that in some of the administration transition literature that uh, mm -hmm. um, they, you know, that that is on somebody's uh, screen uh, to, mm -hmm. to, to look at. Um, I was just wondering whether or not, given the work that you folks did um, as actuaries, whether or not it uh, stayed on the shelf or got pulled off the shelf and there was uh, some, some life that might have been breathed into it. Um, the other issue I, is probably again more for Dana. Is this I'm interested in the um, the bench Vermont's benchmark plan and uh, have expressed this now for a couple of years, and where CMS has made more flexible the ability of states to change um, its benchmark plan. And so far, um, and uh, Illinois, South Dakota, Michigan, New Mexico, and Oregon have done so. And I, I, I hear through the grapevine that we're starting to explore that opportunity. And um, uh, maybe this is more of a statement than a question, but I'm really hopeful that the focus of that effort is on prevention and maximizing prevention and alignment with our all-payer model goals, you know, rather than opening the thing wide open. Um, and, uh, you know, as one of my fellow board members had said, said that the initial process was somewhat of a food fight. And I, so trying to mitigate the food fight as much as possible, you know, uh, you know, in, uh, in order to emphasize prevention, which to me is also an affordability issue because that's, you know, part of the basis of healthcare reform in Vermont that preventing uh, of chronic diseases uh, will save money. So I'm uh, hopeful that Diva uh, and maybe you, but at least Diva can come back to the board in the near future um, and explain this uh, emerging effort to revisit the benchmark uh, plan and uh, profile for the board what the moving parts are and what the hope for um, outcomes are. Um, and with that, that's that's all I have. Unless Dana has some uh, insight into this benchmark plan process. Abby, are you still on the call? Yep, I am. I I'm happy to address that. To make, yep. Know. Yeah. Thank you for raising it. Um, we. I think. I think. Uh, you know, Diva doesn't have you know authority or or jurisdiction to um, look at the benchmark plan in a vacuum. But we have been collaborating with uh, DFR um, as well as your staff to put together a process. Um, to to re-examine the benchmark plan. So I think we'd be happy to continue that conversation and, um, it, you know, in, in collaboration with our colleagues. Mm -hmm. So do you think you'll have enough focus on it in maybe a month or so to be able to come for the board and say, you know, this is still a draft, a, a work in pro progress, but this is kind of what our intentions are? Um, I don't want to speak for DFR or the agency, but um, I, I think the hope is that we will have a better handle on the study that we would be um, engaged in in the next few weeks. Great. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Tom. And I just want you to know, Tom, that Susan told me that um, when the uh, new administration uh, gets rid of that benefits cliff, we're supposed to thank you because you're the, you've been the... Uh, outspoken critic on that for a long time <laughs> no 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 that was not my conversation with susan susan told me that that um president biden was a friend of hers and that uh she, she had asked him to do this and he was going to get it done for her okay <laughs> we'll move to robin thank you um, I don't have a ton of questions. Thank you for coming back with the enrollment numbers. I always love to be able to see that, so I appreciate that. Um, I, um, the, I think the one thing I wanted to also comment on was um, really not related to this particular decision, but as things evolve at the federal level, I think it would be particularly if there 
any rule changes or guidance changes that happen prior to our QHP premium setting process, it would be good for us to be updated on um, those things so that when we're making those premium decisions, it's it's within the new, you know, any new federal context. So we may ask if you could help us with that, Addy, at some point um, in the future. That We may not get much between now and then, but it would be interesting to see if we do. Um, but otherwise, um, I think that's it for me. Thank you, Robin. Jess. OK, uh, thank you. Um, I appreciate all the hard work here. It looks like there is still some uncertainty, but um, mostly these are tweaks kind of at the margin that don't require you know, our approval, um, but for one. So I guess I'm going to ask you a, a higher level question here, and that really is, um, Dana, you outlined some benefit design principles right at the beginning of the presentation. And I'm wondering how they incorporate some of the benefits and some of the principles of value-based insurance design. Um, how do we leverage, there's a whole growing literature, right, on cost-effectiveness research. So how do you, you know, I didn't see it on that, on your benefit uh, principles, but how are you leveraging some of the, you know, evidence that we have about what is high value care and what is low value care as you're designing cost sharing within uh, specific categories, right? Not all radiology imaging is cost effective or high value. Not every ER visit is warranted or cost effective or high value. Not every outpatient procedure is high value. So how do you think about insurance design to start to encourage the high value kind of care that we want to make sure that people are getting? I know there's often 0% copay or, or uh, you know, on preventative care, wellness visits, but I'm also thinking about diabetes treatment, tobacco cessation, things like that, um, where we really want to encourage people more to do more, but we really, there's certain procedures, diagnostic imaging that we know have low value, and how do we start to discourage that kinds of over-treatment or not cost-effective treatment within, within the design principles that you have for these plans, and how much leverage do you have to do that? Well, Thanks for raising that. I, we opted not to make that part of our formal presentation this year, but I can say that we, um, as a stakeholder group, did take a close look at um, the federal guidance around that the currently exists around uh, VBID options, and um, with Wakely's help, had a, um, a close look at what might be potential opportunities for Vermont and discuss that there were no and i can say you know it would have been easier if there was some clear winner there in terms of which services to focus on first uh, but there really wasn't that's not to say that there is no value in the in the exercise and that we wouldn't uh, attempt something in future years but um between the the complexity of studying this and um then for issuers to implement some kind of a change, we determined that we needed to discuss it more as a stakeholder group, but we are absolutely committed to that and continuing it for hopefully a um, blended into our plan designs for next year is our hope. Um, some kind of a, a meaningful um, benefit change that, that does take up these principles of a, of a trade-off of you know, encouraging certain high value care through, through cost share manipulation in exchange for um, perhaps raising cost share for the quote unquote lower value services. So um, I guess I'll answer so that, that right are you is the stakeholder group going to continue? Sounds like there needs to be more conversation and more time. So I guess what I worry about is that if we, you know, you wait until next November to have those conversations, it'll be another year and it won't happen. So I guess I'm just wondering, is there expectation or hope that you'll continue these stakeholder conversations over the next few months so that by November there's there's hope to kind of hit the ground running on VBID? Yes, we wouldn't we wouldn't pause conversation until next November. It would continue you know, between now and then so that we should be prepared with uh, uh, one or more recommendations for next year. 
And, and this is Julie, just to elaborate a little bit, I think on where our, our latest thinking is, and, and Dana, if it's changed already, <laughs> let me know. Um, but, you know, as we went over, you know, again, based on what CMS had proposed, based on the University of Michigan study in the 2021 Notice of Benefit and Payment Parameters, they kind of had a list of high value services that they thought should be a kind of a zero cost sharing, and then a set of a couple of different brand drugs that should be at, at a reduced cost sharing. Um, and then, yeah, a list of kind of uh, overutilized services that maybe cost sharing should be increased. Um, so we looked at kind of the impact, particularly focused on the, the high value services and less so on kind of the, the impact of, of raising cost sharing for the low value. Um, and so we kind of originally had the discussion around it, if there are certain drugs that should be targeted. Um, but where we left off I, uh, was one of the issuers suggested potentially include adding another tier to the drug benefit where some of these high value services might go and we could adjust the cost sharing. Um, but again, yeah, the, given the timing, the implementation and the analysis around there, it wasn't there. So I think that was the latest thinking, but everyone was checking to see if it was op op operationally feasible to do that and getting some additional feedback. Well, I'm cautiously optimistic. I don't know, Julie, if you're willing to share some of that uh, Michigan study and the CMS recommendations with me, I'd really appreciate that. And it's worth thinking about regulatory alignment mm -hmm. and really having all of our regulatory processes be focused on, you know, cost effective, high, high quality, low cost outcomes for Vermonters. It seems to me that this, you know, uh, contributes to that conversation. So I, I'd appreciate any materials that you could share with me on, on yeah. that work. Yep. Yeah, I think we, we provided um, an Excel file that analyzed, again, the impact of, and it was based on a weekly study. It was not Vermont specific, um, so it was looking at national data, um, but uh, it, it looked at the impact for each of the different items listed in the CMS study. So I, I don't think there's any problem with sharing that with the Green Mountain Care Board. That'd be fantastic. Thank you. So that, thank you, Jess. And uh, um, just want to say that I think that Robin made a, a very uh, excellent recommendation to have a future uh, discussion about the uh, federal changes. And um, Susan, if you could mark that on the uh, the calendar for whenever um, people are ready to uh, have that discussion, it would be great. Um, at this point, I'm going to open it up for um, public comment. And I see that Dale Hackett has had his hand raised. Dale. Yes, I've been listening and it's a little difficult to understand all of it. I mean, I'd, I could use a few more hours going over this. Um, but I've noticed like with the the changes that can be made that don't even have to go before the Green Mountain Care Board, I don't think it's hard to see that for the consumer, you can get an increase in premiums and you can also get an increase in what your co-pays are. And it is an ongoing basis every year that this is going to happen, does happen. Um, and then when I stop and think about other conversations I hear about cost of daycare and so forth, I doubt they get the raises that will cover um, even these type of increases that happen every year. Uh, it's just frustrating. I don't know what to do with this, I just don't think we get it because we work with it and we know how complicated it is. But I really don't know how to explain this to the consumer that this is really runaway cost. On top of that, I was very curious of the benefit for vision, pediatric vision. I'm wondering, does that cover everyone, including any child that has really expensive glasses, or is there a cap? Um, and I'm probably thinking of when I was a child because I probably had some of the most expensive glasses you can make. I mean, that's just the way it's always worked for me. Um, so I'm curious if there's a cap on that. Hi, this is Dana. Uh, no, my understanding is that it's not. There isn't a upper um, upper limit other than that that cost share um, applied to it, and being once per year for the um, exam and hardware. Okay, thank you for being one a year too, because with children, 
your vision can change very dramatically from year to year, and it's important to keep up with that. Mm -hmm. That's all my comments. Thank you, Dale. Julie, I see you have your hand up. Is that a mistake, Julie? That was a mistake, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you had something to add there. No, um, probably just click on a lot of buttons and clicked on the wrong one. So. OK. Um, is there any other public comment? Hey, Kevin, it's Walter. Walter, go ahead. Yeah, I can't get it on Microsoft Teams, so I'm in on the phone. Um, I just want to, more of a comment, well, there's one question and then a couple a comment. The question is, is are there are the subsidies going to equal some of these raises? That's the question, because there's absolutely no way that a person making 10, 12, 15 bucks an hour can afford any of this. And I wonder what bubble these the people who design these plans live in. But it's certainly not the same world that we are in. And I just want to back up what Dale has said about that and what Tom has said about affordability. You know, um, these are simply unaffordable and they go up every year. And with all the plan changes and designs, we don't get anything that much or even better for the constantly rising costs that our wages can't keep up with because we don't get raises of 10, 20, 30% every year. So it's, <clears throat> this is a good argument for Medicare for all, really. I did just, I, you know, I can no one can that. really. Excuse me, go ahead. But no, that's it. I can answer a portion of your question uh, that the 2022 subsidy levels will be determined once we have the uh, once the rating, the uh, plan rates are determined because that's all. Then that is part of a calculation for subsidy. And I can say that they have uh, had a general increase each year. Um, it's not the mm -hmm. same each year, and it's also not possible to know, you know, plan over plan exactly how um, how it will change and. But you know, until we have those um, specific rates for 2022 that factor into subsidy, then we'll know. Yeah, and Dina, this is Brittany. I'll just add that your comments are specific to the premium subsidies, um, but some of these members will also be eligible for the cost-sharing reduction variations on the sure. silver plan, which reduces their their cost-sharing. Um, we because the AV calculator did not change. Um, we did not change the CSR plan designs. So though the cost sharing for all of those plan designs and the deductibles for those plan designs um, will be the same as 2021 um, because these members, uh, it you know, it's tied to that base silver plan. We didn't necessarily have to carry through those those increases. So um, I did want to point that out. That is included in the the slide deck and. Appendix A, those those plan designs as well, um, though they don't require formal approval either. Okay, other mm -hmm. public comment? Kevin, I had a suggestion to that last point, which is I wonder if we could um, also I think in the, I don't remember if we get this every year, but in the past we have gotten the enrollment um, into the CSR because that will give a sense for folks of, um, you know, how, how many people are cushioned essentially from any deductible changes proposed this year since the CSR variations aren't changing. Very I'll, good make point. Note of, I'll make note of that. I don't believe that would be any, any problem to provide that. Thank you, Dana. Other public comment? If not, uh, Dana, Addie, Julie, Brittany, um, it's been uh, a fascinating discussion. Um, a lot of information here, um, not a lot of uh, significant changes, and we'll be back on this topic uh, uh, 
um, I believe next week. So um, we may be in uh, further touch um, if some things pop up um, for questions from specific board members between now and then and give you a heads up. Um, but other than that, um, thank you very much for a very informative pre presentation. Board members, is there any old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Good to see you. Thanks. Thank you.